turn me a little down? I feel like I'm real loud. So, <laughs> Pastor Jimmy's okay. He's not on death's door or anything, but he, he has a bout of maybe vertigo, we think. He might have vertigo. He got dizzy and nauseous um, yesterday while he was here, actually. And I think it was just a cop-out. I think he wasn't, his sermon just wasn't ready, and he was like, let me, let me, let me begin now. Now, I mean, those of you who've known Jimmy for a long time, and I know a lot of you have, even longer than I have, know that for Jimmy to tap out on a Saturday night means he's not feeling good. So he's at home uh, resting, um, probably watching, critiquing. Um, he'll have, I'm sure, a page in it. No, I'm just kidding. But um, so I got tapped to preach about, I don't know, 4 or 5 p.m. last night. Yeah, I don't know how much you know about sermon prep, but that's not enough time. So, uh, I mean, it might be enough time for a better preacher, but it's not enough time for me to... So I could have recycled something, but I, I prayed a lot about it, and I kind of went with what God, what I feel like God gave me. So I don't know how long this is going to take. Uh, you might get out real early, and that's okay. You get to tamales faster than everybody else. But um, I really had something that came to mind, and there's not going to be a lot of slides, although that's a pretty one, isn't it? And today we're going to talk about grace. And I don't think that uh, you can go wrong talking about grace. I don't think we can talk about it too much. There's a story that I'm sure you know in John 8. And I'm going to read it. And I'm sure as I read it that it will come to mind. And you'll be familiar with it. But if you want to turn there, because I don't have the words on the screen. If you want to turn there, it's going to be John 8, verses 1 through 11. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came to the temple courts again. All the people came to him, and he sat down and, and began to teach them. The experts in the law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught committing adultery. They made her stand in front of them and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us excuse me, to stone to death such women. What then do you say? John tells us in verse 6. John does this all the time. He has these little parentheses, explains it to us. He says, Now they were asking this in an, in an attempt to trap him so that they could bring charges against him. Okay? Because you're like, well, how are they going to trap him? Well, if he commands them to, if he says, go ahead, you need to stone her, well, then he would be in trouble with the Romans. Because the Romans gave the Jews lots of authority to police themselves because they were really feisty. So the Romans said, listen, you can... We don't get all your laws and all that. You can police yourselves, but you can't kill anybody, okay? That's why they had to take Jesus to Pontius Pilate, right? Because they didn't have the authority to kill him. So if Jesus says, yes, kill her, and to follow the law, what Moses said, what, what God said to do, then they could go right to Pontius Pilate. They could go right to the Roman authorities and say, hey, this man killed somebody. He told everybody else to kill him, and then Jesus would be in trouble. So they're trying to trap him because if he says kill her, then he's in trouble with the Romans. If he says don't kill her, then he's breaking the law of Moses. So they're like, we've got him. We've trapped him. Okay? So they're not genuinely concerned with the law of Moses. They're just doing this to trap him. So Jesus' response, what does Jesus do? Uh, verse 6. Jesus went, bent down and wrote on the ground with his finger. When they persist, he doesn't answer them. He doesn't say anything. He just gets down and starts writing in the ground on the dirt. When they persisted in asking him, he stood up straight and replied, whoever among you is guiltless may be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he bent over again and wrote on the ground. Now when they heard this, they began to drift away one at a time, starting with the older ones, until Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up straight and said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? She replied, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go, and from now on do not sin anymore. Now John doesn't tell us what Jesus wrote in the sand. John's always leaving cool stuff out. In fact, he kind of cops out once. He's like, well, you know, Jesus did and said a lot of other things, but if I wrote them all down, there's not enough ink, you know, in the world. There's not enough paper. I couldn't write down everything he said and did. But sometimes you go, well, you, yeah, we get that, but you could have, you know, filled in the gaps a little bit for us. So John doesn't tell us what Jesus wrote in the sand, but in the movie of Jesus' life, Cecil B. DeMille, um, so Ronnie's probably seen this movie. It's kind of an older movie. I think he was a kid. It depicts Jesus spelling out the names of various sins. 
Jesus is riding out sins on the, on the sa- in the sand. Adultery, murder, pride, greed, lust. Now, if you notice, who, who started to drift away first? The older ones, which is interesting. And again, we don't know why the older ones drifted away first. It could be that they sinned more. <laughs> so he got to their sins first. That's true, it, or that could be. It could also be that maybe they were a little wiser. You know, they were, they were Pharisees, but they were, they, were not, they were not unintelligent men. They weren't necessarily unwise men. And maybe they were wiser and they knew that they were sinners. And they knew that Jesus had them. They knew that he had slipped out of their trap. And notice Jesus' words, the grace that he gives. Had she committed an offense that was punishable in the law by death? Yeah. Was Jesus in his right as God to order her to be killed? Yeah. Sure. It's his right. God has a right for any of us. (laughs) Um, But he says, God says, I do not condemn you either. I do not condemn you either. Is that my next slide? Is that the quote I have up there? I do not condemn you either. During a British conference on comparative religions, experts from around the world debated what, if any belief, was unique to the Christian faith. They debated if any belief was unique to the Christian faith. They began eliminating possibilities. Incarnation? Other religions had different versions of God's appearing in human form. Resurrection. Again, other religions had accounts of return from death. The debate went on from so, for some time until C.S. Lewis wandered into the room. And C.S. Lewis is most famous for The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But what you might not know is C.S. Lewis is probably the greatest Christian apologist and writer of the 20th century. Probably. So C.S. Lewis wanders into the room. And he asks what they're talking about. What are they arguing about? And he heard in reply that his colleagues were discussing Christianity's unique contribution among world religions. And Kelsey knows it. I know. Lewis responded, oh, that's easy. It's grace. It's grace. See, uh, the Pharisees criticized Jesus because he ate with sinners, okay? They're always getting on to him. They're saying he, he eats with sinners and tax collectors. All the time, Jesus is going around, he's, he's hanging with these people, and he's, he's eating with them, which was a much bigger deal in their culture than in our culture. To eat with somebody, to go into their home or to welcome them into your home was this level of acceptance that, like, they would never do. They would never eat. Pharisees would never eat with tax collectors and sinners, and yet Jesus is doing it all the time. So he tells them three parables about the joy of finding something or someone who's lost, the, mo- the most famous of which is this, and I know you know this one as well, but we're going to read it anyway. Then Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that will belong to me. So he divided his assets between them. So this man has two sons. The older son gets two-thirds of the inheritance. The younger son gets one-third. And when do you usually get an inheritance? When when they die, right? When your parents die. So when when the younger son tells his father, Father, I want my inheritance now, what what is he telling his dad? Yeah, you're not dying quick enough for me. You're still around, and I'm wanting some of that scratch. I need you to, why don't you just give it to me up front? In the parable, the father just does that. And in and, and those days, it would have been some work. It wasn't like he was just moved some money into an account. He would have had to sell land or sell crops or sell flocks to get money to give to him. So it wasn't just, it was a difficult thing. It probably took him a while to get this, his inheritance. And it might have hurt his business. It might have hurt his life. So he gives him, after a few days, after a few days, the younger son gathered together all he had and left on a, on a journey to a, to a distant country. And there he squandered his wealth with a wild lifestyle. Then after he had spent everything, a severe famine took place in that country. I'm sorry, we are in, I forgot to tell y'all, we're in Luke 15, starting verse 11, if you want to read for yourself. Just make sure I'm not adding anything or subtracting anything. Luke 15, verse 11, and now we're in verse 14. Then after he had spent everything, a severe famine took place in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and worked for one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. So we know what what kind of country he's in, because they're feeding pigs. 
We know he's not in Israel. And he's, we're assuming he's an Israelite. So now he's feeding pigs. He's feeding unclean animals. And in verse 16, it says, He was longing to eat the carob pods the pigs were eating. He was wanting to eat the pig food. He was so hungry. But no one gave him anything. So I don't know what kind of job. I mean, it's not a great job, obviously. They're not paying him. So and I, maybe he's just sleeping outside with the pigs. In verse 17, but when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired workers have food enough to spare, but here I am dying from hunger. I will get up and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired workers. Why does he say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you? What was his sin against heaven? He sinned against his father. How did he sin against heaven? All sin is a sin against heaven. Now, well, that's what we, there are no private sins. There are some people that go like, oh, well, that's only hurting me, right? It's not hurting anybody else, so I can do it. All sin is a sin against heaven. I've sinned against heaven to you. So he got up and he went to his father, verse 20. But while he was still a long way from home, his father saw him and his heart went out to him. He ran and hugged his son and kissed him. Then his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. So he goes up to, to see his father, to go back to his father. And while he's a long way from home, his father saw him. And his father runs out to him. What does that mean? his father saw him while he was still a long way off. You think he just happened to glance out there at the road and be like, oh, what do you say? He's walking for him. Every day. Every day he was waiting for him. So he goes to the father in verse 22. Look at how he responds. But the father said to his slaves, hurry, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate because the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. You see, that's about grace. Is grace is the opposite response that you think is going to happen. And all these stories, these parables that we're going to talk about and the stories that I'm going to tell, grace is always kind of seems to come out of left field. It's not the typical response. I mean, this son basically treated his father like dirt, said, I wish you were dead, took his, took his inheritance, and then wasted it and squandered it. And he comes home, and his father is waiting for him. He runs out to him, and he says, my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And they celebrate. Now, his older son was in the field. Remember, this, this older son, how much of his father's estate is he going to get now? All of it. Every, anything that's left, the older son's going to get it all. So now his older son was in the field. As he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the slaves and asked what was happening. The slave replied, your brother has returned. Your father has killed the fattened calf because he got his son safe and sound, back safe and sound. Verse 28, but the older son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and appealed to him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I've worked like a slave for you. I've never disobeyed your commands, yet you never gave me even a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And I, I, don't know how this, I don't know how the older son knew what the younger son had wasted his money on. Maybe somebody had told them, told, come back and told, hey, you know what's happening? You know what your younger son's doing over here? Yeah, on MySpace? Man, you are old. Then the father said to him, son, you are always with me. And everything that belongs to me is yours. Remember, he's going to get all the inheritance. Verse 32, verse 32, it was appropriate to celebrate and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And this is a parable. This is the, one of the parables that Jesus told in response to why he hung out with sinners, why he ate with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors. And the old, you know, we can, we can dissect this story. Who is the father? This is really easy. You can, everybody can get this one. Who's the father in this parable? Say it a little louder, I can't hear you. God, there we go. That's, that's the one, it's like the Sunday school answer this teacher asks, you just say Jesus, and you like hope. That's what they're asking for. Uh, who's the young, who's the older son? Pharisees. Right? They follow the law. 
They're not sinners and prostitutes, tax collectors. They, fall, they obey God. They, they work. They follow the law. They obey God. And yet, Jesus is spending time with who the younger son? The sinners. The tax collectors, the prostitutes. Why is Jesus spending time with them? He tells it in the parable. Uh, right before, he's got the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin. <laughs> and it's this idea of grace. In verse 32, it was appropriate to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is, he is alive. He was lost and is found. See, when we look at people through the prism of grace, which we don't often, often do, it's really hard to, but if we look at people and we look at them through the prism of grace, they all look like children of God. Without that, they don't. We see, we look at the world and we go, or they did, they're like, that person's a sinner. That person's a prostitute. That person's a tax collector. But see, when you look at people through the prism of grace, they all look like children of God, which they are. Grace is about being lost and then found. And say, I don't remember what I put on these slides, so you're just going to have to, when you find an appropriate one, you can, you can do it. When I say what's on the slide, you can go to it. So there's a, there's a song, there's a title of this <laughs> This mess that I'm calling a message. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was what? But now am. Was blind. But now I see. So how is grace manifested? How do we show grace? How do we look at people through the prism of grace? Through forgiveness. Now, we as Christians, we're supposed to ask for forgiveness. Not just something that we expect. We're supposed to ask people for forgiveness, confess our sin, repent. But we're also supposed to forgive. I'm pretty sure this is the next one. Let's see how well I did. Oh, 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 yep. He who cannot forgive another breaks the bridge over which he must pass himself. He who cannot forgive another breaks the bridge over which he must pass himself. Um, there is a, a woman named, and I'm going to butcher this name probably, uh, Marganita Lasky. She was a secular humanist and atheist novelist, and she said on a TV interview not long before she died, what I envy most about you Christians is your forgiveness. I have nobody to forgive me. Forgiveness and grace that go hand in hand. That's what we have to offer the world. Also in Luke, and you can turn here, Luke seven thirty six. So there's another story of grace. Luke 7, 36, it says this. Jesus is with the Pharisees. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. See, he didn't just eat with sinners and prostitutes. He also ate with Pharisees, who were just as bad sinners, even though they didn't think they were. And behold, a woman of the city who was a sinner, and you all know what that means, when she learned that he was reclining at, t at, at table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of ointment, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began, to, she began to wet his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were really a prophet, like he says he is, he would have known who and what sort of woman this is who's touching him, for she's a sinner. See, in those days, if you were a Jew and somebody who was a sinner touched you, what did that do to you? It made you unclean. You stayed away from them because if they touch you, if sinners touch you, now you're unclean. So this Pharisee says, you know, if Jesus really was a prophet, if he really had discernment, if, if he really knew what was going on, then he'd know who was touching him. She's a sinner. And he's, now, now notice it says when the, uh, he said it to himself, which means he didn't say it out loud. Of course, Jesus in verse 40 says, Jesus answering <laughs> said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he went, oh. He says, say it, teacher. And he tells this, and I know you're familiar with this, but hopefully you can see the little theme. A certain moneylender, verse 41, had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii. Now, now how much was a denarii or a denarius? It was a day's wages. So 500 denarii, that's almost two, well, you know, it's over a year. It's like a year and a half. It's a lot of money. And the other 50, a certain moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? You could have been a Pharisee. That's what Simon says. 
But Simon answered the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, which was a, the custom. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. And I know that sounds weird, but they would give themselves kiss of friendship, right? But from the, from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Why? Why are her sins forgiven? It's interesting. We always think that Jesus is going to say, well, her sins are forgiven because of X, and he never says it. He always says these things that kind of make us uncomfortable. Because he says, her sins are forgiven for she loved much. Hmm. But he who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her in verse 48, before he died on the cross, just as God, he says, your sins are forgiven. That's it. Your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And people will say, Jesus never claimed he was God. He went around forgiving people's sins. Everyone in the ta- at the time knew that was a claim to be God. And they say, who is this? He's forgiving sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Nadine Collier is the daughter of Ethel Lance. Ethel Lance was one of the people who was murdered by the Charleston shooter. I told the story before, I won't go into all of it, but he shows up at a Bible study, they invite him in, he goes through the whole Bible study, and then he kills him. One of them was Ethel Lance. Nadine Collier is the daughter of her. And during his arraignment, just days after his terrorist attack, Nadine said these words, I just want everybody to know to you, I forgive you. You took something very precious from me. I will never talk to her again. I will never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. You hurt me, you hurt a lot of people, but God forgives you and I forgive you. (laughs) If that's not grace, if that's not supernatural power, I don't know what is because I don't know that I could do that. I don't know if you could do that. In Matthew 5, 38... Jesus said, this is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, which Jimmy's going over. He said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, where was that said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Yeah, it's the Bible, the law. It was written. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. But whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn turn the other to him as well. And if someone wants to sue you and to take your tunic, give him your coat also. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you. Do not reject the one who wants to borrow from you. This is completely opposite of our natural instincts. Grace is completely opposite of our natural instinct. But our natural instincts are sinful. So in verse 43, he said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I preached a message on this in, in Memorial Day, on Memorial Day, or right before Memorial Day. But I say to you, love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be like your Father in heaven, since he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and and the unrighteous. God loves them both. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors do the same. And if you only greet your brothers, what more do you have? Even the Gentiles do the same. So then be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Brennan Manning, who wrote a was a really, really interesting individual. He was a great writer who passed away. He said, Grace is sufficient even though we huff and puff with all our might to try and find something or someone that it, can, can, that it cannot cover. Grace is enough. Grace, Charles Spurgeon said this, Grace puts its hand on the boasting mouth and shuts it once for all. It's one of my favorite quotes on grace from a man named Thomas Adams. He says, Grace comes into the soul as the morning sun into the world, first a dawning, then a light, and at last the sun in its full and excellent brightness. That's what grace is like. Flannery O'Connor, the great Catholic writer, said, All human nature vigorously resists grace. Why? 
because grace changes us, and that change is painful. When you exhibit grace towards other people, when you look at other people through the prism of grace, that actually changes you. That changes us. When we forgive people, when we show them grace, when we do the opposite of our natural instinct, that actually changes who we are. It makes us more like God, because God shows grace. And then... The, the great writer Paul, <laughs> the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said this, Now the law came in so that transgression may increase, but where sin increased, grace multiplied all the more. So what is grace? Grace is Stephen. Who killed Stephen? Who held the coats while the Pharisees stunned him? Paul did. That's the guy who wrote this. Grace is Stephen with his dying breath crying out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Grace is Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What real Christianity can offer this world is nothing more and nothing less than God's scandalous grace. And the world needs that grace now more than ever. I don't have to tell you that. You think the world could use a little more grace? You think Christians as a church, we could exhibit a little bit more grace? Maybe? Just a tad bit more? If we are not defined by that grace, then we have nothing with which to offer the gospel. For this world will not listen to a graceless gospel. They're not going to hear it. Nor should it. A graceless gospel is a false gospel, just as a graceless Christian is a false Christian. As they look, as, and as I look around, I see a lot of people who claim the name of Christ exhibiting the opposite of grace. I could go on and on with verses of Scripture, passages, parables of Jesus, but if you are resistant to this message, then only God can change your hearts. Be careful, though, because Jesus says at the end of the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, is this on my slide, babe? Thank you. This is what he says at the end of Matthew 6. And Jesus says these things, and then we just kind of live our lives like it's not true. We, we justify it, or we just kind of theologize it away. It's a fancy word, Ronnie. Jesus says this at the end of the Lord's Prayer, For if you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, your Father will not forgive you your sins. That's what he says. If you do not show grace towards other people, God is not going to show grace to you. Why? Because a graceless Christian does not truly know Jesus. You can't know Jesus. You can't have a relationship Jesus, with Jesus. You can't have your life cha- changed by the grace of God and not show grace to others. Now, no, we're not perfect. I'm not saying to be perfect, but if your life is not characterized by grace, you don't know Jesus. Matthew 7, do I have Matthew 7? Matthew 7, 21 says this, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not everybody who expects to get to heaven is actually going. I don't know if you know that. There's a lot of people that are going to spend their lives sitting in church pews. They're going to go, Lord, Lord. But he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, 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 will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and do many powerful deeds? Didn't we go to church every Sunday? We went on mission trips and for the city and we tithe money and we watched, we showed our kids veggie tales. I don't know what else we were supposed to do. Then I will, then I will declare to them, what? I never knew you. I never knew you. To the graceless Christian, Jesus will say, I never knew you. I remember years ago, there was an individual who I really disliked. I did, not have a, I did not have very grace-filled thoughts towards this person. And then one night, as I was praying with the kids before bed, I asked them, what should I pray for? Who should I pray for? And they asked me to pray for this person. <laughs> and I did not want to. <laughs> but as I did, God changed my heart. That will change you. A child asking you to pray for him. And I know, guys, I know that there are some people that just are really hard to forgive. 
I know. And if there is someone that you cannot forgive, just pray for them. Pray for them. You don't have to like it. You don't have to want to do it. And when I say pray for them, don't pray, Lord, please wipe them off the face of the earth. That's not the kind of prayer I'm talking about, okay? Pray for them. Let God change you. Some of you might be familiar with the story of, of Les Miserables, and I'm going to butcher the French translation. Just deal with it, Cody. I'm sorry. I haven't been there. Sentenced to a 19-year term of hard labor for the crime of stealing bread, Jean Valjean gradually hardened into a tough convict. No one could beat him in a fist fight. No one could break his will. At last, Valjean earned his release. Convicts in those days had to carry identity cards, however, and no innkeeper would let a dangerous felon spend the night. For four days, he wandered the village roads, seeking shelter against the weather, until finally a kindly bishop had mercy on him. That night, Jean Valjean lay still in an uncomfortable bed until the bishop and his sister drifted off to sleep. He rose from his bed, rummaged through the cupboard for the family silver, and crept off into the darkness. The next morning, three policemen knocked on the bishop's door, to, on the bishop's door with Valjean in tow. They had caught the convict in flight with the stolen, stolen silver and were ready to put the thief in chains for life. The bishop responded in a way that no one, especially Jean Valjean, expected. So here you are, he cried to Valjean. I'm delighted to see you. Had you forgotten that I gave you the candlesticks as well? They're silver like the rest and worth a good 200 francs. Did you forget to take them? Valjean was no thief, the bishop assured the police. The silver was my gift to him. That, my friends, is grace. The kind of grace that God gives us. The kind of grace we're supposed to show others. The kind of grace that the world will never understand. It's the grace that says, had you forgotten that I gave you the candlesticks as well? Let's pray.